Hey everybody, welcome back. This week we're going to take a look at one of the most well-known stories in the Bible, Jesus' arrest and trial. We're going to uncover how Jesus was making a profound political statement that modern-day Christianity almost has completely misunderstood. So, you ready? Let's dive in. As always, this channel's really starting to grow and pick up steam, so subscribing, liking, commenting below really makes a world of difference to getting this content out there. We also have a weekly podcast, so be sure to check that out. It comes out every Wednesday, and I'll make sure to post all those links in the description below. At the time of recording this video, we're exactly one week away from the 2020 presidential election. As with any American election, there is clear tension in the air. Throw in a pandemic, racial injustice, and the global economy being in a recession, and it seems that the stakes have never been higher. Evangelical Christianity has become increasingly vocal about politics in America, to the point where it's pretty hard to be on social media these days and not see some very strong opinions from Christians. There seems to be a growing number of Christians that are almost becoming militant about their politics. With all that in mind, today I want to relook at the trial of Jesus in a historical context that may show us how this political form of Christianity may totally miss what Jesus was actually trying to show us. But before we get to Jesus' trial, we have to set the political landscape that Jesus found himself in. The Roman Empire was the ultimate superpower in Jesus' day, and their goal was to expand their kingdom as far as possible to reap the financial and military strategic rewards that came with having a massive presence. Their goal was to expand their presence to as many countries as possible, promising protection and economic stability, but usually at the cost of making those people they occupied second-class citizens. And even though they preferred that the countries they occupied go willingly and peacefully, this wasn't always the case. So wherever they occupied, they had a military presence and they taxed all the citizens of that land. Now this tax was critical because it further funded their conquest into all these other countries, but it was usually disliked by the foreigners who were forced to pay it. In 63 BC, under General Pompey's leadership, the Roman armies captured Jerusalem, implementing their taxes, their military, and in some cases, their religion. This means that Jesus, born somewhere between 6 and 4 BC, lived under Roman occupation his entire life. And just so we're clear, this was no small thing for the Jewish people. The Jewish people had a history of being enslaved but believed that one day they would be completely free as a nation under God only. And this idea of absolute freedom was critical to their understanding of the scriptures when it came to the Messiah. The prophets of the Old Testament wrote extensively about this Messiah who would come to save them from their oppressors. And at this point in history, the Jewish people were waiting and praying for the Messiah that was promised to come. It is interesting, though, in my studies I found that it seems that the Jewish people were more concerned about the Messiah coming to fix their political problems than they were about restoring their true relationship with God. So, all things considered, it wasn't uncommon for the priest of Jesus' day to send out investigative teams to validate the claims of those who perform miracles and claim to be the Messiah. This is why we constantly see the Pharisees in groups whispering among themselves when Jesus is teaching or performing miracles. They were attempting to verify if he was actually the Messiah that was promised. Now, like I said before, the Jewish people were not happy about being under Roman occupation. And ever since the Romans captured Jerusalem, there was always a group of Jewish people who were dedicated to getting their freedom back no matter what the cost. This group of Jewish people would have considered themselves freedom fighters, but to the Roman government they were considered terrorists. And during that time it was not uncommon for these Jewish freedom fighters and the Roman soldiers to clash in violence. I'm sure all over the Jewish people understood why these freedom fighters were fighting, but it definitely made everyone's lives more difficult when it came to coexisting with the Romans. So, 
Jesus was born in chaos, he was raised in chaos, and later Jesus dies in the midst of this chaos. For Jesus, this clash between the Jewish and the Roman people is all he knew. And as Jesus got older, things only became more tense. And what a lot of people may not know is that these clashes between these two groups of people made the teachings of Jesus even more divisive. For example, when Jesus says, You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I tell you not to resist an evil person, but whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn them to the other cheek as well. So, put yourself in the Jewish people's shoes. In Matthew 5, 38 and 39, turning your other cheek is not something these freedom fighters wanted to hear when it came to dealing with Rome. In fact, to these freedom fighters, turning the other cheek would have been a form of defeat. To a Jewish freedom fighter, if the Messiah hasn't shown up yet, and Jesus is saying, turn your other cheek so they're not allowed to fight back, it means to them that they are doomed to be oppressed. Just making sure we're totally clear, Jesus was opposed to the freedom politics of his day. He was not on board with the idea of fighting back against his Roman oppressors. If you look back in the Gospels and see all the times Jesus was calling for peace, know that to the Jewish people this wasn't just some fluffy feel-good statement. Jesus was taking a political stance that would have angered tons of Jewish people and even been perceived as weak. And at the same time, Jesus is claiming to be the Messiah, the one who's supposed to bring them freedom. How can Jesus, the one claiming to be the Messiah, bring the Jewish people freedom if he's not willing to fight? Now, let's fast forward to the end of Jesus' ministry. After the Last Supper, Jesus takes his disciples to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray. Jesus knew what was coming. It's in this moment in the book of Matthew we see Jesus entering into some of his most well-known prayers, then chastising his disciples for falling asleep when they were supposed to be keeping watch. At this point, Judas has already betrayed him, and we see the scene play out when the mob comes to apprehend Jesus. And while he was still speaking, behold, Judas, one of the twelve, with a great multitude with swords and clubs, came from the chief priests and elders of the people. Now his betrayer had given them a sign, saying, Whomever I kiss, he is the one. Seize him. Immediately he went up to Jesus and said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. But Jesus said to him, Friend, why have you come? Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and took him away. And suddenly, one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword, struck the servant of the high priest, and cut off his ear. But Jesus said to him, Put your sword in its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Or do you not think that I cannot now pray to my Father, and he will provide me with more than twelve legion of angels? How then could the scriptures be fulfilled, that it must happen like this? In that hour, Jesus said to the multitudes, Have you come out against a robber with swords and clubs to take me? I sat daily with you, teaching in the temple, and you didn't seize me then. But all this was done so that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples forsook him, and they fled. Now, it doesn't say it specifically in the book of Matthew which disciple took out their sword, but if we flip to the book of John, we see that it was actually Peter. We know that Peter chops off the ear of the high priest's servant, but clearly that wasn't the intent. Peter was going for the kill shot, but he missed. And in that moment, we have Jesus making another statement. He tells Peter those who live by the sword will die by the sword. That at any point, if Jesus felt like it, he could call down legions of angels to protect him, but he doesn't do it. Jesus is setting the stage for peace. An interesting side note is that Peter's attempt at freedom only ended up cutting the other party's ear off, literally impeding their ability to hear correctly, a wound that only Jesus was able to heal. That could be a sermon in and of itself, but I digress. Let's fast forward again. At this point in the story, Jesus has now been delivered to the high priest for a complete sham of a trial. They attempted to bring multiple false charges against Jesus, but what ended up sealing Jesus' fate was his words in John 2.19, where he said he was able to destroy the temple and raise it up in three days. 
To the high priest, this was a form of verbal terrorism. So not only are they oppressed now by the Roman people, but there's now a guy out there claiming to be the Messiah and saying he's going to tear their temple down. You can see how this would have enraged the high priest. So they have Jesus beat and then they proceed to take him to the Roman authorities because the Jewish priests actually didn't have the power to execute him themselves. Around sunrise, they bring Jesus to Pilate. For those of you unfamiliar with the story, Pilate was the Roman governor over Jerusalem at that time. And it's really important that we understand who Pilate was to better understand what's going on in the story. Pilate's job as governor was to balance what we now call the Pax Romana. Pax Romana basically just translates into Roman peace. The concept of the Pax Romana is kind of an oxymoron. They move into foreign lands, they tax the people, they set up military establishments, while at the same time convincing people that they're oppressing that it's for their own good. That by allowing Rome to occupy them, it will actually bring a greater peace. And I can't stress enough how much money and taxes was a huge part of this. For Rome, taxing those people that they were oppressing meant that they could further fund their conquest into other areas. So for Pilate, this means he had to keep enough peace to make sure that the money was flowing and the people were still paying the taxes, but at the same time ruling sternly enough to keep the Jewish people under his submission. This was definitely a balancing act. Because if Pilate just decided to kill every Jewish people who opposed him or stepped out of line, there would be a huge revolt on his hands. But when certain Jewish people would step out of line, if Pilate did nothing, he would be perceived as weak and then they wouldn't submit to him at all. Once again, this was not an easy balance. If Pilate makes any mistakes in this balance, the Jewish freedom fighters would have destroyed him by either revolting because he's governing too strongly or attacking him and his armies because he's being perceived as weak. Pilate did not have an easy job. And historically speaking, Pilate wasn't very good at his job. He was actually known to provoke the Jewish people. He would sometimes put images of Caesar as God outside of the Jewish temples to upset the Jewish people. And this would cause riots. Sometimes Pilate would acknowledge his mistake and back off. And other times, he would use force to just beat and kill the Jewish rioters. This was happening before and after the death of Jesus, and would eventually be the reason Pilate loses his job and ends up disappearing from history altogether. In short, Pilate did not have a good reputation with the Jewish people. But because he was the Roman governor, he alone had the authority to have Jesus executed. At this point in the story, it's safe to assume that Pilate had probably heard stories about Jesus and didn't really want to have him executed for fear of causing a riot. Pilate proceeds very carefully. Now Jesus stood before Pilate, and Pilate asked him, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said to him, It is as you say. And while he was being accused by the chief priests and elders, he answered nothing. Then Pilate said to him, do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he answered him not one word, and Pilate marveled greatly. Now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to releasing to the multitude one prisoner whom they wished. And at that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. Therefore, when they had gathered together, Pilate said to them, Who do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? For he knew that they had handed him over because of envy. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent to him, saying, Have nothing to do with that just man, for I have suffered many things today in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the multitudes that they should ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor answered and said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release to you? They said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, what then shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? They all said to him, Let him be crucified. Then Pilate said, Why? What evil has he done? But they cried out all the more, saying, Let him be crucified. When Pilate saw that he could not prevail at all, but rather that there was a riot rising, 
he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. You see to it. And all the people answered and said, His blood is on us and on our children. Then he released Barabbas to the people, and when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Barabbas is another key character we have to take a close look at to better understand the story. In Matthew 27, 16, Barabbas is called a notorious prisoner. And in Luke 23, 19, it says that Barabbas was in prison with rebels who had committed murder against the Roman armies. Barabbas was one of those freedom fighters we were talking about earlier. And not only was he a freedom fighter, but he was a notorious freedom fighter. People knew who Barabbas was. Barabbas was a leader of the freedom fighter movement of the Jewish people. You can imagine that there was likely many Jewish people who viewed Barabbas as a hero because he was fighting for their freedom. Interesting side note about Barabbas. In some manuscripts, Barabbas is actually known as Jesus Barabbas. Barabbas would have been translated as Bar, meaning the son, and Abba or Abbas, meaning of the father. Many scholars believe that Barabbas' full name was most likely Jesus Barabbas, but it was excluded from our modern day Bibles to honor Jesus the Christ. Jesus, or in Hebrew, Yeshua, is better translated into Joshua. Joshua during Jesus' time would have been a very common name. This trial was actually the trial of two Jesuses. Two men who wanted to bring freedom to their people in drastically different ways. Barabbas was a fighter. He would kill for his country and his people, and he was known for showing results. So much so that he now finds himself in prison for fighting for the freedom of his people. And then you have Jesus, claiming to be the Messiah, the promised one. And to the Jewish people, yes, Jesus had good messages, and yes, he performed miracles, but where was this freedom that the Old Testament was promising? Jesus is out there preaching peace. Meanwhile, his people are being beaten and in some instances killed. We have two men on trial, both in the name of freedom, but very different approaches on how they were going to get that freedom. The kingdom that Barabbas envisioned was only achieved by violence and war. The kingdom that Jesus was bringing wasn't by force, but by love and sacrifice. Make no mistake, freedom for the Jewish people was the highest priority. I believe this was their ultimate guiding factor when deciding between Jesus and Barabbas. Who could bring results and who was going to deliver them the freedom that they wanted? On top of that, you have the priest in the crowd whispering to people, telling them that Jesus is a heretic. And to the Jewish people, the priests were their ultimate moral authority. The choice seems pretty clear. This was a showdown of politics in its simplest form. Which candidate was going to give the people their freedom? And even Pilate tries to sway the crowd's opinion of Jesus, but he's unsuccessful. At this point in Pilate's career, he had made many mistakes when it came to governing the Jewish people. And he could see that if he didn't give the Jewish people what they wanted in this moment, there was going to be a riot and there was going to be violence. After failing to persuade the Jewish people, Pilate washes his hands and says, Jesus' blood is on you guys now. And how the Jewish people respond is very interesting. They say, let Jesus' blood be on us and our children. So Barabbas is loosed and they get the freedom fighter they had asked for. What's interesting is that even after Jesus' death, the tension between the Jewish people and the Romans only got worse, culminating in its conclusion about 40 years later in 70 AD when the Roman armies completely surrounded Jerusalem and killed over 1 million Jewish people. The Jewish people got the freedom fighter they asked for in Barabbas. They chose to go down the path of violence versus the path of peace. And I believe when they said, let Jesus' blood be on us and our children, they were actually making a prophetic statement. The disaster they were bringing upon themselves by choosing the path of violence actually ended up destroying their children's generation about 40 years later.
At this point, you may be asking, okay, but what does any of this have to do with American politics? I want to attempt to show you that the same two kingdoms the Jewish people were deciding between during Jesus' trial are the same two kingdoms we as American Christians are faced with today. Like I said at the beginning of the video, the approach I'm seeing many Christians take today is doom and gloom and militant persuasion. Maybe you've heard some of these Christians say things like, you can't be for God unless you vote for. If we don't vote for then our country is doomed. We as Christians have to stand up and fight or else we're letting the enemy win. Have you seen or heard this kind of language from Christians recently? This may upset a lot of people, but I believe this form of Christianity is echoing the same statement the Jewish people had when it came to freeing Barabbas. Well, we know Jesus is real and he's good and all, but if we don't stand up and fight for our country, all will be lost. The problem with that approach to Christianity is that it's a sword cutting off the ears of people that need to hear Jesus the most. We see Jesus bringing a kingdom of peace, love, and sacrifice, but it doesn't yield the results we want or in the time frame we want, so we trade the kingdom of peace for the kingdom of war. Make no mistake, there are Christians out there right now who believe the opposing political party is their enemy. And instead of turning the other cheek the way Jesus would have, they've taken it upon themselves to fight the good fight of Barabbas. And you might be saying, well, whoa, that's a little harsh. I mean, these people aren't killing people the way Barabbas and the freedom fighters were. And you'd be half right. Remember, Jesus said that murder starts in the heart. But I think the real question is, where are we putting our faith? Personally, I'm going to vote, and I'm going to continue to vote in upcoming elections. But the party or candidate I vote for is in no way bigger than the kingdom of peace and love that Jesus stood for. So if we as Christians are sacrificing our ability to become peace and love at the altar of politics, we may be serving the wrong kingdom. Blessed be the peacemaker. In all things, seek first the kingdom of God. You see, the kingdom that Jesus came to establish was always bigger than the politics of man. The Jewish people wanted freedom from Rome, and when Jesus failed to provide that for them, they turned on him. Because the freedom Jesus was offering was much bigger than their politics. The freedom he was offering wasn't of this world. I think many Christians out there believe that if they're not fighting the good fight of their politics, it makes Jesus less known. I would argue that Christians sacrificing their ability to look like Jesus in the face of opposition is what's making him less known in America. So by all means vote, be engaged, but never let that come above loving your neighbor. Choose the kingdom over politics. Look. We're one week away from this election, and maybe your candidate will win, and maybe your candidate will lose. But I promise you, what's bigger than either political party is you becoming love and peace to the world around you. That's what Jesus died for, to bring the kingdom of peace and love and sacrifice. So the big question is, which kingdom are we serving? You guys are awesome, I hope you stay safe, and remember, your ability to become love will always leave religion defenseless. See you guys next week. Peace.